happen that by the Holy Ghost. This is just for all of us. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Yes. Uh, I think it's important that we keep that in the midst of our heart, even with all of the messages about be and believe and belong and become, um, begat, beloved, betrothed. betrothed. Um, even last week's message about betrothed, uh, it's about seeking him. And sometimes what happens, in, and it, I know we don't plan this because it's, it's still about him, but we can get sidetracked in, in uh, sometimes about the, the seeking the promise, seeking the promise, or seeking the things, or seeking the blessings. And uh, so what was just spoken this morning was not just for one, it's, it's a word for all of us is to make sure we keep seeking him. Seek the promiser, not the promises. Yes. Because in the seeking the promiser, the promises come forth. Yes. Amen. Because the promises are in the promiser. Yes. I said the promises or the blessings of God, the rewards of God are in him. You press into him and you run after him and you desire to know everything there is to know about him and uh, the rest of it falls in line. I said the rest of it yes, falls in line. And I'm sure that if I was to give some, uh, uh, turn the mic over this morning to some of you, you'd be able to all testify of the times that you've just run hard after him and it's just like the blessings of God just fall on you. You're not even looking for him. All you're looking for is him. All you're doing is looking at him, running after him, chasing yeah, after him, yeah. and all of a sudden there's a blessing here and there's yeah, a blessing there yeah, and there's a blessing yeah. here and a blessing there. Yeah. It's just like stop looking at the promises. As wonderful as the promises are, stop looking. We got to know what the promises are. Amen. Because when they, when they manifest or when they show up, we got to know that it's from God. Yeah. But the key is, is you've got to know God. Yeah. I said, you've got to know God. And you've got to know him more. Amen? Amen. We've got to know him more. How many believe that you can know your father more? Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. He desires that for us to know him more. Paul even said that over in the book of the Philippians. He said that I would know him more. Yeah, Paul said that. that I would know him more. And you think Paul, the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament, mm -hmm. to make a statement that I would know him more with all the revelation and the time that he spent in the Holy Ghost yeah. receiving from the Father, receiving from the Holy Ghost, receiving from Jesus. And Paul makes a statement, oh, that I would know him more. Can we all say that? Oh, that I would know him more. Oh, that I would know him more. Glory to God. That's my heart's desire, that I would know him more. Amen? Amen. Well, we'll dismiss our kids at this time. Amen. That wasn't even the message. That was just a precursor. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So put up the white if you need it, going back with them too. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, just want to say thank you. Uh, for allowing us to go away for a couple of weeks. That's the first time that we've ever done that uh, since we've come to California and, and uh, took the church back in, in December of 2012 to go away for a couple of weeks like that. And uh, it was very nice. It was very nice. But it's, it's even nicer to come back. It's because when, when uh, you've got a church in your heart and you've got people in your heart and you've got a home in your heart, uh, you can only be gone so long, and you got to get back. you got to get back. So know that, that you guys were in our heart the whole time when we were gone. And uh, so good to come back. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. Well, let's open up with a word of prayer.
as we get into the Word. Father, we thank you this morning. I thank you this morning that by the Holy Ghost that I would speak as an oracle of God, that I would declare the things that you would want declared, that I would speak the things that you would want spoken, and that by the Holy Ghost, revelation would come forth, and that the eyes of all of our understandings would be enlightened and open, and that we would know the hope of our calling, and that you would take the word that maybe we've heard, the logos of the word that maybe we've heard multiple times over and over again, and you would take that Logos word and that the life within that word would come forth and bring revelation to our hearts. And we would see things differently than we've seen them before. And we would build on the truth and the revelation of the word of God like never before. So we give you glory and honor and praise for the fruit of the Word of God. This morning, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. You know, while we were gone, we got a, the first week that we were gone after we got up north uh, to Minnesota, we were able to spend the first five days with our pastors uh, and hang out at their, stayed at their house and just hung out with them. And one of the things that we talked about, and I just prayed it, uh, that Pastor Duane had ministered on a, a, not all that long ago by the sounds of us we were talking with him, but the importance of the, the rhema word of God. Yes. And that it's through the rhema word of God is where we get our answers. Um, the logos word of God, which is the written word of God, is so vitally important because it's a, it's a road map. It's an instruction manual to the things of God, but it's also a gateway it's a gateway for the Holy Ghost to take the Logos word and begin to open up and begin to speak to us the truths that are within the Logos because there's so many truths that are in the Logos. We probably all could give testimony after testimony of reading scriptures over and over and over again. And at one point you read a scripture and you get revelation of that and then uh, it could be months, maybe even years later, you're reading that same scripture and all of a sudden God will give you some new rhema or new revelation and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. where have I been? I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've said to her, where have I been? Yeah, right. But it's just because it's alive. When it, when it says that the Bible, the word of God is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, it's alive because it's constantly, it will constantly bring revelation to your heart. It's not like, well, I know this scripture and then it's all over with. It's just like, no, it's breathing. It's alive. Yes. It brings forth nourishment. Yes. It brings forth life. Yes. Every time you read it, even, there's even in those times where it seems like you're not hearing anything, it's breathing life into your spirit. And if you stick with it and you hang with it and you trust God and you talk to God about it, the, by the Spirit of God, he'll reveal things in that. The Logos word was always meant to speak to us. Right. It wasn't meant just to be spoken, even though it was meant to be spoken. Because the Bible tells us in Romans uh, chapter 10, it says that faith comes by hearing. And then it says by hearing by the rhema, or hearing by the word of God, which means hearing by the rhema of God which means as the Logos word is spoken, it was always meant through the Logos word as it is spoken, that that word, because it has life in it, would begin to speak back. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And until you hear it speak back, you stick to with what the, word, the written word says. I, I, I say that so many times to people. They're just like, well, I just don't know what to do. It's just like, well, that's not true. Do you spend any time at all in the Word? Well, yeah, I do. I spend time in the Word. You read the Word. Yeah, I spend time reading the Word. Uh, and, and I don't ever ask how much because that puts people, backs people into a corner because some people only read it, you know, five minutes a day. Well, that's between them and God, not between me and them. But if you read the Word or know anything of the Word or you've gone to church for any time of time, don't ever say, I just don't know what to do because you do know what to do. If you know anything about the word, whatever you know, do that. Yes. Do that. There was one. I'm, this isn't even, well, it kind of is my message because if you want a title for the message today, we've been in the realm of B. Um, and, and the Lord, gave, she asked me as we were driving home, she says, have you got anything else to go along with B? And I said, no, I really don't. 
and I didn't until we got home, and then the Lord dropped it in my heart. Beginning. 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 But I'll finish saying what I was going to say. There was a young man one time uh, that I was wanting to sit, get together with me, and he was struggling and not wondering, you know, went wanting God to speak to him and wanting some specifics. You know, sometimes God doesn't give you the specifics. When I say specifics, meaning giving you a go here, talk to this person, or go to this place, or whatever. He'll give you a, 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 a picture of what to do or where to go of, of the revealed word. But anyways, without going further with that, he just, he's like, I just, God's just not speaking to me. And I said, well, and I asked him these questions, just like I said here. I says, well, you spend time in the Word, don't you? And I knew he did. I knew he was a person of the Word for the most part. I said, you spend time in the Word, don't you? He said, well, yeah. I said, and you spend time reading the Word. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, and you've been coming to church for a number of years, haven't you? Pretty much raised in church, I says. And now, now you're, you're doing life with Jesus on your own, not underneath mom and dad and so on and so forth. Well, yeah, yeah. I said, you serve? Yeah, do all that? Yeah, mm-hmm. I says, then you do know what to do. And he just kind of looked at me and says, keep going to church. Keep reading your word. Keep praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep serving. Keep bringing your tithe. Keep bringing offerings. Keep trusting God. I said, keep doing what you know to do. In other words, that's what I'm saying is when, when you're not hearing anything specific at the moment, keep doing what you know to do. Don't ever back off because what happens, the enemy will try to get you to think that, well, God's not talking to you or nothing's happened to you. And the only reason why he does that is because he wants you to now even back off what you know. That's right. He wants you to back off what you know and begin to entertain thoughts as, well, I don't know if this even works, or I don't even know if God's real, or I don't even know if God speaks to him anymore, or I don't even know, I don't even know, I don't even know. No, you got to say, no, I know certain things because I've been walk. I walk in them, I've been walking in them, I have walked in them, and I'm going to continue to walk in what I know until I get something else. But I'm not backing off of what I know. Right. I know that I'm supposed to go to church because the Bible says forsake not the assembly of yourself. So I'm just going to keep going. I know that I'm supposed to be hooked up to a body and, and bring my supply. And he, Ephesians chapter 4 says, and be a supply joint. So whatever my supply is, I'm going to bring it because I know that's what I'm supposed to do. I know the Bible says to bring your tithe to the storehouse according to the scriptures. Well, then I'm going to bring my tithe or the Lord's tithe to the storehouse and offer it up to him and making a declaration of faith that by faith I'm already blessed. Yes. I'm going to bring offerings. I know I'm supposed to do that. I know I'm supposed to spend time with the body of Christ. And I'm not saying live, you know, continually, just constantly go, 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 go. But I, I know that I'm supposed to fellowship one with another. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And you could go on the list and list whatever it is for you that you know that you've read in the word and you've accepted as truth. Right. And you do what you know until you hear something different. Yes. But I rest assured, I will tell you this, he will speak to you and add to, because that's what the revelation in the rhema word of God is, he will bring revelation to what you already know yes. and elevate what you already know to another level, yes. to walk in yes. a different place yes. Yes. with him. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So I say all that to say that was some of the things that I got to talk to my pastors about. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It just stirs me up. Amen. I love sitting with my pastors. Glory to God. It was hard to even leave them. Only because it's mom and dad. Amen. But, but we know that we've got things that God wants us to do. and We know it has to do with all of you. and has to do with Thriving Life Church. So even though it, it seemed almost bittersweet to, to leave Minnesota, it was just like, well, we love you, but we got work to do too. Just like they got work to do, we've got work to do. Yeah. So glory to God, here we are. Amen. Well, as I said, if you like titles, we're going to talk about beginning. And this probably could have been one that could have been shared right away in the beginning because we've got to know that God gave us a new beginning. Yeah. Amen? God gave us a new beginning. And we really need to grab hold of and grasp uh, within our heart 
Uh, the Lord spoke this to me yesterday as I was meditating on it. Uh, we need to grab hold and grasp within our hearts the emphasis and the importance of that God gave us a new beginning. He didn't give us Jesus. He didn't give us Christianity. He didn't give us the church. He didn't give us everything that we know, whatever all of us know, just to be an enhancement to the life we already had. Come on. He gave us a new beginning. It wasn't just something to add to the life we already had before Christ as an enhancement to Come make on. our life a little bit better. Come on. Come on. Because the Bible tells us that we've been crucified with Christ. Christ was crucified. He took our old life and crucified it. Which means if it was crucified, there was nothing to enhance. Come on. <laughs> I said, if he, he, if he was crucified and we've been crucified with Christ, according to Galatians 2.20, there was nothing to enhance. That means it was, we're starting over. Yeah. I said, we're starting over. I mean, you just think about what the Bible says about being born again. Well, born again means you're starting over. Nothing about your old life existed anymore. You're being born again. The old man was crucified, and there's been a new man that has been born again. And that new man has been born from above. Yeah. He's given us a new beginning. Yes. I said he's given us a new yes. beginning. Yes. Glory yes. to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, as I was looking at this, there were some scriptures that he started to direct me to. If you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 8. I'm just going to set a little foundation here. Hebrews chapter 8. In verse 12, it says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I'll remember no more. See, that's the way God looks at giving us a new beginning. He don't remember anything about your old life. He does not remember anything about your old life. Any unrighteousness, any unrighteous deeds, any unrighteous works, anything about your fallen nature, even if you were a good person and you really didn't do anything wrong, we know the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right. So no matter right. what degree... Right. I said no matter what degree... Of things we know we've all sinned. Can you say can, yeah. can you say amen to that? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So be it. We know that we all sinned and we all fell short. So to whatever to, ever, to whatever degree you fell short, we're we're not going to grade. You know, it's like well, I didn't fall short like that. Dear Lord, you know that I didn't fall short like that person fell short. I mean, I know some people that really fell short. No, you fell short. <laughs> short is short. Short is short. Like the old saying goes, you can, you can shoot a BB at a window and crack it, or you can drive a truck through it. Either way, the window's broken, is it not? It's been compromised. It's broken. It needs to, be, it needs to have a new beginning, <laughs> which means it needs to be removed, and a new one needs to be put in its place. Yeah. Amen. There you go. <laughs> It, not, not like Safeway Glass. Safeway Glass, you know, they got, the, they got the deal where if you get a chip, they can take a, a, whatever it is that they take and put it on there and fill the little chip and everything. And, and it's just like, uh, no, that's just a little enhancement done to keep the current windshield that you have so you don't have to replace it with a brand new one. Well, God's like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sending Jesus. I'm not sending my son and have him uh, become sin and go to the cross and then raise him from the dead just so you can have a little enhancement. So there's still some, because how many know safe light glass, uh, even when they come and do that, there's still a blemish. That's right. It's not unseen. That's right. Amen? Amen? What God did, he gave us a brand new beginning. There is no blemishes left. Amen. How many know there's no blemishes in your life? Amen. Amen. Now the enemy would like to try to convince you differently of that. He'll, he'll try to always bring those things to your remembrance. Amen. 
And today we're going to receive communion at the end. And, and this, this message is so good that re, part of remembering, one of the biggest things of remembering what Jesus did is that we've got a brand new beginning. And there's nothing left. I said, there's nothing left. Amen. Say it with me. There's nothing left nothing of left. my old life. We've got to grab hold of that. And, and God says this so clearly. It says here in Hebrews 8, 12, it says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? Can you say thank you, Jesus? Amen. Aren't you glad that he doesn't remember your past? then why are you? Come on. See, that's the only thing that'll hold us back from our new beginning. That'll, the only thing that'll hold us back from our fresh start is if things from our past want to creep up into our memories, into our thought life, and say, well, you know, sometimes it comes through well-meaning people. Sometimes it comes through the ones that love us the most. And I'm not looking at the ones sitting in front of me. Now, I say that because we've done that to each other. You get into those heated moments, intense fellowship, as we call it, and we'll bring up things from the past. I said things to her. You haven't changed a bit. Well, dear Lord, thank God God forgives me and remember, doesn't remember the stupid words in my mouth. Amen? Because first and foremost, it's, it's, I'm talking to his daughter. And I'm telling his daughter, you ain't changed? Yeah, come on. My, my, my. How dare do I talk to a daughter of the Most High God and say, you look the same as you did before you got born again. You haven't changed a bit. Yeah. <laughs> come on. So there's well-meaning people in your life that will try to tell you that. Your own body will try to tell you you haven't changed. Come on. Yes. Yeah. Your own body will try to tell you, well, that nothing's changed. Come on. The thing we say here is uh, our bodies will try to speak to us and tell us certain things because it was trained in a certain way before it was born again. Yeah. And one of the things that we've, that, and I've heard from the pulpit, and I know, I know how it was intended, um, but, but I've, I've, I've walked away from even saying certain things like this is, well, as long as you've got this body, you're always going to have trouble. That's a lie. Because the Bible tells us that we're to keep our body under. Paul said, I keep my body under. Yeah. Now, whether he did or didn't, I'm not, I'm not going to even go down that road. But he says, I keep my body under. Whether it was just a, a confession of faith and his body still gave him fits or not, it really has no bearing on anything. The fact of the matter is, is our bodies aren't to talk to us anymore. Right. And when they do try to have a voice, we're to tell them, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Glory to God, because God's given us a new beginning. And that new beginning is in the spirit of man. Come on, it's in the spirit of man. And in the spirit of man, that's where we begin to exercise our faith, exercise our dominion, exercise our authority of everything that's in the natural. Yeah. Meaning our bodies, circumstances, situations, everything. But it all has to come out of where the new beginning began. The new beginning became in the spirit of man. Through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin where God says, I don't remember that anymore. This scripture just came to be good. Go to Colossians. I'm going to kind of skip over here a little bit. Colossians, I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I'll start reading in verse 11 of Colossians chapter 2. It says, When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. So see, we were circumcised, not like they were underneath the Old Testament, 
but underneath the New Testament, we were circumcised because our old nature was cut away. So now there's a new beginning. That old nature doesn't exist anymore. It was cut away when we came to Christ. Goes on to say here, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to a new life, or you could say a new beginning. You were raised to a new beginning because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. So you were dead. You were dead because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But now that you're born again, now that you've put your trust in Christ, by faith you've trusted in the Son of God and what Christ did is that now you're alive. It says, then God made you alive with Christ. So you were dead, but now God made you alive. Yeah. Does that not sound like a new beginning? Yes. You were dead, but now you're alive. Yeah. Yeah. A new beginning, a new lease on life, not an enhancement to your dead life. How many know you can't do anything to something that's dead and make it better? You can't put any makeup on it. You can't. You can't disguise the smell of it. Yeah. No matter how much perfume you, perfume you put on it. Come on, it stinketh. Dead is, yeah. dead. dead is dead. If you've ever gone to a funeral before and, and there's been a, a viewing and you look and you go up and look at the person laying there, you know there's no life in that. It's dead. I don't care how good the mortician does, how good a job they do about putting makeup on and dressing them up and doing their hair and everything, you know there is no life in that. So you were dead, but God gave you a new beginning and put life into you. Can you say amen? Amen. It says, then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. Verse 14, he canceled the record that contained the charges against you. He canceled the charges and the record that was against you. In the natural arena, you could say your record was expunged. You've been pardoned. There is no record of past wrongs. When you put your trust in Christ, there's no record of past wrongs. <laughs> Nothing. And now that you're in Christ and you live in Christ, there's no record of wrongs and past wrongs because they're under the blood. They're under the blood. They're under the blood. I said, they're under the blood. You've been cleansed of all unrighteousness. They're under the blood. They've been canceled. Now, I heard this preached before, and I thought, well, I'm not going to say where I heard it because it doesn't make any difference because it's, I, I don't, uh, uh, it's my revelation now. <laughs> yeah. Amen? Amen? It's not the person I heard it from. But under a witness protection program, how many are familiar or ever heard of a witness protection program? When someone is called in to be a witness, and uh, it would be in a case in such where their lives would be placed in danger because they've actually witnessed something, I witnessed something, and they can put someone, their, their testimony can put someone in prison. And usually the people that can be put in prison hold a very high level uh, of wrongdoing <laughs> and many connections. And uh, they would be glad to snuff your life out. So when someone is asked to, do, to, to testify of that, uh, the legal authorities will put them in a witness protection program, simply meaning that they will give them a brand new identity. I said they'll give them a brand new identity. They'll give them a new name. They'll give them a new place to live. They'll give them probably even a new social security number. Everything about them is brand new. Amen. Now the key to the witness protection program working for somebody, if you were ever to be placed in one, is you have to completely forget your past. You're told you can never associate with family again. I'm not advocating you don't associate with family. This is a message of you need to cut. <laughs> okay. So I want to preface some of the things that I'm saying here. I'm not uh, taking this literally. In, in some cases, it is taken literally. I'm just telling you. But I'm not going to preach on that this morning. 
But uh, you'll be told, you know, you have to dissociate with family. You have to dissociate with all old acquaintances, all old friends. You have to dissociate with places that you used to go, places you used to frequent. Uh, everything about your old life, and meaning everything, everything about your old life is no longer, no longer exists, and you have to live in that way. And if you don't live in that way, what it does is it puts you in a position to be found. It puts you in a position to be found. Meaning, uh, it puts you in a position that you now place your own life in danger. Are you understand where I'm going with this? If God has given us a new beginning, there are things that we need to disassociate ourselves with. When the Bible says, and I'm not exactly where the scripture is, but it just came up to me. When the Bible says, give no place to the devil or give no place to the enemy, that means disassociation from your old life is of utmost importance. Yeah. Because if you do not disassociate yourself with old areas of your life, where the enemy really played a havoc in or had a, a foothold in your life, uh, you can't uh, tiptoe around dance around, skirt around, even a little bit, because the moment you begin to associate with it, the one who's trying to kill you, the one who's trying to snuff you out, the one who's trying to take you out so you can't fulfill the plan of God and the purpose of God in your life, will bring an end to the new beginning that God gave you. disassociation with your past life is of utmost importance. And I, I, I know I've heard too many times, you know, well, what's the big deal? I'm telling you it's a big deal. It is. I'm telling you it's a big deal. Because if the Bible says that the uh, enemy goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, He's going around. He's looking for the ones that, that are trying to, that are to reassociate themselves with their past life. He's looking in the places where you used to hang out. He's looking in the places with the people that you used to spend time with that you shouldn't have spent time with. He's looking in the places that led you down paths of unrighteousness. He's looking in those places. And if he sees you messing around in them places or he sees you entertaining them places, I'm just saying, he, it opens up, and we don't need to open ourselves up. Can you say amen? amen. I'm saying all this not, not, not to bring a level of fear into your life. I'm just saying, we don't, the enemy takes enough cheap shots without us giving him any assistance. Yeah. Amen? That's what I would, that's, maybe that would be a better way for me to say it. Let's not give the enemy any assistance because he's going to continue to go around and, and he, he's going to try to bring old things and old thoughts up to you and old memories up to you in certain situations, try and get you to remember things and trying to get you to denounce Christ and try and get you to turn your back on God and try and get you offended with the church or people in church and try, he'll try to do all kinds of things. How many, no, it, it, we, we ought not give him any help. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I said, we don't, he doesn't need our help. But so many times, those in the body of Christ, and I'm trusting that you're not, and if you are, uh, the, I'm trusting that this message will help you. If he's given you a new beginning, um, well, first, let me say this. You've got to first believe that your new beginning is better than your old life. I says, you first got to grab onto the fact is the new beginning that God gave you far, everyone say far, far, far surpasses anything that your old life had to offer you. Far supersedes. That goes along with what I said in the beginning is uh, what Jesus did wasn't to enhance what you had because what you had is so far below what God and Jesus has made available to us. And God's just like, I can't enhance something that's unrighteous. I can't enhance something that's not even remotely close to my life and what my life was to be. And, and for us to ask God to enhance something that Jesus died for, that you were crucified for, why would we even want to do that? 
Most of the time, the only reason why we want to do that is because we think what we had was go all right. We're con we've convinced ourselves, or others have convinced us, that it's just like, well, there wasn't, you know, that, that was pretty good. I mean, there was a time uh, when I got delivered from drugs and alcohol, uh, after I was set free, I would still have limited conversations with people if we got into the conversation of that lifestyle. And I would make the statement is, you know, I know that, that drugs and alcohol wreaked a lot of havoc in my life, but nobody can tell me that I didn't have fun. Those would be the words I've had that I would say. Nobody could tell me that I didn't have fun. And I'd think and reminisce about, you know, the, some of the things that I did. And, and I, I actually thought that that was still, there was a period of time, even after being set free, that I thought that was fun. And then be, as I began to be, uh, got introduced to Christ and began to understand the life of Christ and the new beginning that he gave me and, and what fun really is or what excitement really is, what joy really is, what peace really is. All of a sudden I began to recognize there, that that was a counterfeit of fun. There was nothing about that that was fun because what I thought was fun was still leading me down a path of destruction and could have been easily, and in my case probably would have been loss of life at a very young age. So there was nothing fun about it. And if I really was to look at, when I say loss of life at a very young age, there were a number of things that I considered fun during then that I almost lost my life. But the thrill and the excitement of it was just like, oh my gosh, it was so much fun. You know, rah, doing this and doing that. I got crazy and, and, and all. I stand back and look at it. It's like, wow, what a distorted way of looking at fun. <laughs> So God's given us a new beginning. He's expunged. He's canceled the record. There is no record. With God, there is no record. He chooses to remember no more. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 9 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19, says, it says, Do not, the prophet Isaiah says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider... Don't even consider them. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. That's why Paul said in the New Testament, he says, I forget those things which are behind and press towards those things which are ahead. Paul also in one place says, all those old things, he says, I count them as dung. Well, I don't need to elaborate on what dung is. <laughs> Come on. Paul said everything about my life, and prior to him finding Christ, he was in a position, he, he was becoming very prominent within the Pharisees and within the leadership of the religious organization at that time, and he was being raised up, and he had some pretty good clout. I mean, he went to them and said, you know, give me the right or give me what the credentials that I need to start killing Christians, and they're like, hey, you got it, dude. You're the man that we know we can put on the job. Paul didn't esteem any of those things. He didn't look at any of those things as holding any level of prominence or anything because he knew the life that Christ had given, the new beginning, the new lease on life. We know that God's given us a new lease on life. Amen. He's given us a brand new lease on life. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. Most of us know this scripture, but it says that uh, that's the scripture that says he'll remove out of us, he'll take out of us the stony heart and give us a new heart, a heart of flesh. Now, I like the New International Version of this. The New International Version says, instead of giving us a new heart, the New International Version says in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, chapter 36, verse it says, he'll give us an undivided heart. So if you're born again, you have an undivided heart. I said, if you're born again, you have an undivided heart. I like that because what that tells me is that when there's something that wants to creep up in your life or a temptation comes into your life, it's not your born again spirit. It's not the new life that God's given you that is desiring to do that. It's something other because your heart is undivided. Your heart is 100% 
for God. Which this tells me that if he's given me an undivided heart, then there's the other two factors that I, the, the makeup of who I am. It's either the soul or the flesh that wants to make a decision. See, I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me because it helps me. When something comes up in my life that is contrary to God and the things of God, it's not God, it's not the new man, the new spirit man that God put within me. It, it tells me by, tell, by this saying, he's given me an undivided heart. It tells me that my heart's not polluted. Yeah. It tells me that my heart's not struggling with this. Right. It tells me that my heart's not one that's wanting to make the decision. Because see, that's what the enemy comes along to do. He'll try and muddy that all up in our lives and tell us, you know, well, you, you, you're, you haven't changed any. Because if you would have changed, you wouldn't be thinking that way. And what we do is we grab onto that and we immediately assign or, or, or think, sometimes even unknowingly, well, there must be something wrong with my heart. No. The Bible tells us he's given us a new heart. The Bible tells us he's given us an undivided heart. It has nothing to do with our heart. We're just not letting that undivided heart make the decision right now. We're letting the soul or we're letting our flesh make a decision. And we've got to begin to become stronger and walk in that new life that he's given us. Say, no, no, no. That flesh is not going to make a decision anymore. That soul is not going to make a decision anymore. But the heart that is 100% for God, the heart that is not divided, whether it should go this way or to go that way, that heart that is one uh, is focused, it's, it's one minded, it's, it's one way and that is towards God yeah. Yeah. I said it's towards God right. and we all know when things come up in our lives whether or not it's towards God or not towards God come on, come on. Yep. because there's an, an instinct nature within us that knows what is good and what is not why? Because we've been created in his likeness and his image. Yeah. Everyone say, I don't have a divided heart. I, don't have a divided heart. I do what my father wants, I what my father and I wants. find great pleasure in it. I, I walk in the ways of Christ, I and I find great pleasure in it. I because I love him, I love and him. he loves me. He loves Glory me. to God. An yeah. undivided heart. Now, all throughout Scripture, God shows us pictures of new beginnings. Amen. From the time Adam and Eve fell. See, that was a new beginning because when you read the book of beginnings, Adam and Eve, God's just like, I'm starting. A new be I, 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 there's going to be a new beginning here a race of people that are going to be my people. I created them for my pleasure. They're to fellowship with me. We're going to walk together in the cool of the day. And then we know what happened. Adam and Eve, they, they let go of the beginning that God intended. But God always had a plan for a new beginning. He started preaching the gospel immediately about Christ, even telling Adam and Eve what would happen. And then Abram comes along. And God finds Abram, and if you look over in Genesis chapter 12, we're just going to look at a couple examples. Genesis chapter 12. This is God and his plan of always having a new beginning. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family. Now we're talking, to, yeah, this, is, this I would like to say as we read this, uh, what I shared just a little bit ago, this is God putting Abram and Sarah in the witness protection program. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 4, so Abram departed. So Abram departed. 
See, God gave us a brand new beginning. We've got to, in that brand new beginning, we've got to be like Abraham and depart. <laughs> and depart doesn't oh, it just necessarily mean or isn't just, well, I go to church on Sunday and I read my Bible. I even carry the title of Christian. <laughs> a new beginning means there's evidence. There's departure. In the picture of departure, what God is trying to tell Abraham here is you've got to remove yourself from the things that you know to be able to adhere to and begin to practice or function in the things that I'm going to teach you. Yeah. In other words, what God is saying here if God would have been able to, and this, I'll apply this to our lives, if God could have taught Abram and blessed Abram by leaving him in his current situation, he would have done it. So we need to grab a hold of this and realize for the blessings of Abraham and the power of God to work in our lives, there has to be departure. If he could do it, in other words, it's not about enhancing our current life. If God could have enhanced Abram's life, what he's telling Abram here is, I can't enhance, I can't make better, I can't do anything as long as your thought realm, your actions, everything about your current life the civilization that you're in, I can't do anything with that until I remove you from that. See, there's a new beginning. For there be to be a new beginning, there has to be an ending. I said, for there to be a new beginning, there has to be an ending. That means some things need to come to an end for the new beginning to start. Yeah. What we want to do is we want the new beginning many times, and I'm, only, I'm speaking this from my own experiences, uh, is wanting some new beginnings while we don't want to bring anything to an end. Wow. <laughs> Come on. And we see a picture very clearly here is God saying, I can't start anything new until you come, until you're willing to end. And notice Abram, he was very quick to, it's just like... If this is what God is saying, then I'm departing. <laughs> and he was willing to depart from everything. Now, this is, this is something I'm not advocating that you leave family or so on and so forth. But I am saying that if God tells you to make some hard decisions like that, you've got to be willing to do that. Yeah. These, are, these are things that, that can be a hindrance in our walk with God. I can only tell you from our own experience some counsel that we received early on because our marriage was pretty much over. We'd been separated for eight weeks. I won't go into the whole testimony, but we had been separated for eight weeks. Uh, God got a hold of my heart. I got born again. Uh, she was born again, but not living as, as Jesus being Lord, just kind of Savior. She recommitted her life, and then some counsel to us was, um, is you need to protect this marriage at all costs. Because there's going to be situations that you're going to face, especially amongst family members on both sides, that are going to speak negatively or they're going to want to take up sides. You know, well, you don't understand what he did. I don't know why you're going back to him. Or you don't understand what she did. I don't know why you're going back to her. And the counsel to us by our pastors is when those things happen or those beginnings begin to rise up, you need to cut yourself off. Yeah, from the hearing side of it. It wasn't cutting ourselves off from them. It wasn't saying you can never associate with your family again. You can never talk to your family again. You need to cons basically consider it's like they don't exist. They've died. It's just like you need to be very mindful of the things that are being spoken, the things that are being said, the things that are contrary to faith, the things that are contrary to life, the things that are contrary to what God wants to begin to do in your lives, the, in, the, in the new beginning. And we took heed to that. And because we took heed to that, we removed ourselves out of many situations. 
many situations. And it, did we remove ourselves from that, from them, from our families 100%? No. We still participated in family events until the, and many times until the family events started to go south. And when they started to go south, we'd say, we're sorry, we're done. Wow. We wouldn't necessarily say it that way, but that was what we did. It's like, we're sorry. And we would excuse ourselves very kindly and remove ourselves from that situation. Okay. And uh, uh, years later, our life, our walk with Christ, our marriage, everything about our lives was a testimony unto God. And people in our family, primarily my, my mother, uh, began to testify of those things and began to tell us, I understand why you guys have the marriage that you have. I understand why you have is because God's in the middle of it. Now, if we would have stayed in many situations, that testimony may not have ever come forth. But we were counseled by the Spirit of God through our pastors that you need to depart certain situations. You need to depart and remove yourself. And, and yeah, we, we got asked multiple times in those situations after the fact. We'd get asked, it's just like, well, why'd you leave? All the family was together. So it's like, yeah, you're right, it was. But we just felt it was the right time to go. We didn't go into long explanation and discourse because they wouldn't have understood it anyways. Yeah. They may have just gotten offended. We just said, yeah, well, it was just time for us to go. Well, why? We were having so much fun. Well, yeah, you guys looked like you were having fun, but it was just time for us to go. You know, you just try and soften it the best way you can, but when it's time to depart, it's time to depart. And there's certain things in life you need to depart from. There's some, meaning there's certain things that you just don't need to partake of anymore. You need to separate yourself from. Um, and we've pr primarily lived our life that way in situations. Is uh, I'll give a very simple one. This is a good one here. We were at an event in the town that we grew up in South St. Paul. And uh, it was an event that was called Composure Days. It was kind of like a weekend event where they had a fair for the kids and bands and all kinds of things. And, and we went with somebody to this. And uh, we were asking, you know, you want something to drink? And they weren't asking us if we wanted alcohol. They just said, you want something to drink? We said, well, yeah, sure. You know, I'll have a Coke. And I think she had a Coke or whatever it was too. Well, they went and they got the drink. And when they brought the drink back, it was merely a Coke but it was in a Bud Light glass. And we departed from that. You say, what do you mean you departed? We threw it in the trash. You say, why would you throw a Coke in the trash? Because it was in a Bud Light glass. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, there were people that were already beginning to. We'd been born again and saved long enough, and this is the town that we grew up in. There were people that were beginning to look at our lives and see the testimony of our life. They didn't know that it was Coke in a Bud Light glass. To somebody else, it would have been, well, that's a beer in that glass. Well, for us, that wasn't acceptable. Now, for you, that's between you and God. But for us, that wasn't acceptable because we didn't want that association. We had to depart even from the appearance. See, the Bible talks about departing from even the appearance of evil. Why? Because people come up with their own thoughts. How many know people? Have you ever had someone come up with their own thoughts about you or in your life? And it's just like, what are you talking about? Because people will come up with their own thoughts. So there are things that we've departed from in our life just simply because what people will think. You say, well, what do you care what people think? Well, it's a testimony of whether or not they're going to look at God or not. Sometimes our actions and the things that we're not willing to depart from will determine whether or not, or, or will determine how they begin to look at God, and how, the, how they view God, and how they see God, and how they see Christ, and how they see our lives. And See, because the, one of the biggest things about a new beginning, in a new beginning, if God's given us a new beginning, our life is to look different. Yeah. Yeah. Our life is to look at actually very starkly different. There should be a great contrast between the life that we did live and the life that we now live. Or the life that our unsaved friends and family members and whoever live compared to the life that we now live. If it just kind of blends in, come on, life is not supposed to blend in. 
Now that doesn't mean uh, we, we need to be careful as believers, the ones that have the God's given the new beginning. We need to be careful that we're not judgmental on them because what we can't expect anything different out of them. They're not born again, just like it couldn't be expected out of us. Come on. Sometimes we get this, well, I just can't believe what the world, I can't believe what they're doing. I can't believe this. Well, they're doing what they do. They sin. Why? Because they're still sinners. I mean, we were there once. They do what they do. To sit there and get all wrought up and all nervous, well, I can't believe what they're doing. Well, my gosh, they don't have the life of Christ on the inside of them. Why would they do anything different? Yeah. <laughs> The bigger question is, is why are you still doing the things you do? You got the life of Christ on the inside of you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on that toe. <laughs> oh, but we're not supposed to blend in. But in the process of not blending in, we need to be able to help those that are struggling in the areas, saved or unsaved. Right, right. Saved or unsaved. Yes. It's not to bring condemnation. It's not to bring judgment. It's not to shake our bony finger at them. I just can't believe it. I've been guilty early on. I said, I can't believe they do that. They're, they say they're born again. Yeah, they're born again, and they're just giving place to their flesh. They don't, they don't understand yet that they have an undivided heart. They don't understand they have an undivided heart. When they understand that they have an undivided heart, they'll stop doing what they're doing. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. But God asked Abram to leave and depart from that current situation so he could give him a new beginning. So he could gain back or begin to start again what he intended from the beginning over in Genesis chapter 1. Yeah. Well, we know if you read history in Old Testament, things gone astray, and the Israelites uh, end up sticking around in Egypt, and, and that whole story in itself is Joseph was part of a new beginning, and when Jacob and the rest of the family came, they ended up camping out in, Israel, in Egypt. They were never meant to camp out. The dream that Joseph interpreted, interpreted from Pharaoh was to store up the grain because there was famine coming is because God was seeing ahead and making provision yeah. for his people. Yeah. And so when Jacob and the rest of the family came, Joseph was set up in a, in a position to, now, to be able to take care of his people. Yes. And the problem is, is Israel was never intended to stay in Egypt. They were supposed to get their supply, their provision, and then continue on to the promised land. But instead, they sat back and they thought, well, this is pretty good. This provision is really nice. We like it here in Egypt. We'll hang around. And they go into bondage. They did not depart. They were supposed to be passing through. That's right. Going on to the greater promise yes. or the promised land. And they didn't. And because they didn't, and they began to mingle back in with what God said, don't mingle with. They go into bondage. Yes. And then again, through God's graciousness and God's mercy, he says, I'm going to give my people a new beginning. He says, I'm going to give my people a new beginning. And he delivers Israel out of the hands and out of the bondage of Egypt. Now, see, this is one of the things that I want, you, want us to grab a hold of. With a new beginning, everything that Christ did on the cross, there are types and shadows of the Old Testament that tell us what we have now, not waiting for, not hoping to get, not even waiting to manifest in our life, when God delivered the Israelites out of the bondage of Egypt, it says over in Psalm 105, you can go over there and read it. I believe it's verse 37, maybe verse 27. Well, what did I write down here? Verse 37. Psalm 105, verse 37, without turning over there, it says that God led them out, or you could say God gave them a new beginning 
with silver and gold and not one feeble, not one sick among them. Meaning that when you got born again, the day you accepted Christ and put your trust in Him, He gave you a brand new beginning with silver and gold and perfect health. If you have anything other than that, the enemy is lying to you and trying to tell you you don't have the new beginning that God gave you. I said, if you're experiencing anything other than being delivered and given a new beginning with silver and gold and perfect health, because that's exactly new beginnings, that's exactly what it's telling us here. Egypt is a picture of the world in the world system in the Bible. Israel is a picture of God's people. Well, the church is a picture of God's people along with Israel still. And it's a type and shadow to, to let us know that there is one coming. It's a picture of Christ. Moses is a picture of Christ, the deliverer. And that the deliverer is going to come. How many know Christ has already come? When he comes and you put your trust in him and you follow him, he will give you a brand new beginning and walk you out of or deliver you out of bondage, poverty, sickness, disease, anything else that the world system had them bound in. Come on. He'll walk you out with silver and gold. He'll walk you out with health in your body. Fullness of everything that you have. And the thing that that goes along with that is that once they were delivered out of that, God still wanted them to continue to depend on him every single day. That's a whole other message I'm not going to go into, but that's that's an area that we fall down in sometimes is once we get, we put our trust in Christ and we get delivered and things start going well, we do just what the Israelites did. We repeat history. We need to be better at not repeating history, which is becoming independent. (laughs) Or merely, it's like, life is good. (laughs) Self-sufficient. There, that's a good word to use. But see, we see that all throughout Scripture, new beginnings. You go on, and Israel was led into captivity with Babylon as well, into Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, and held them in bondage. Multiple times Babylon held them, and God delivered. God gave them a new beginning. God gave them a new beginning. And the new beginning always came when the people repented and turned towards God. So I would say this this morning. God's given us a new beginning Let's keep our faces towards God (laughs) so we don't have to go into those places of dry drought, go into those places of bondage, go into those places of lack. Let's keep our face turned towards God. Amen. 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 But thank God because the one great thing, and I'll close with this scripture over in Lamentations. Lamentations, verses 3. Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23. See, the the goodness of God, the blood of Christ, is God is always there to give us a new beginning, just like he was with Israel. See, this is the love of God expressed towards us. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. It says, the unfailing love of the Lord never ends. Can you say the love of God never ends? The love of God never ends. By his mercies, we have been kept from complete destruction. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each day. His mercies are new every day. So even when we make a wrong decision, Even when we 
our soul makes a choice, and we're not made, we haven't made that choice out of that undivided heart that he's placed within it, that heart of flesh. Even when our flesh gets the best of us and we make a fleshly choice or a carnal choice, a carnal decision that's contrary to the life of God that lives on the inside, we are assured that God's love is never ending. We are assured that his mercies are new every single morning. So be rest assured. He's given us a new beginning, but with God, because he remembers those things no more, as it said in Hebrews chapter 8, his mercies are new every morning, even when we make those wrong choices or those wrong decisions, that it's as if God says, I'm giving you a new beginning. Every morning, he says, I'm giving you a new beginning. Aren't you glad that God's unfailing love, he said, every morning, I'm giving you a new beginning. You may have made a wrong choice yesterday. You may have even made a wrong choice the moment you opened your eyes this morning. But you know what? My mercies are new every morning. My mercy endures forever. And today is a new day. And today is a new beginning. It's a new beginning with me. It's a new beginning in the promises of God. It's a new beginning in my love. It's as if you've just been born again, again. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And my blood washes over you and my blood cleanses you from all unrighteousness and you are my children. Aren't you glad? Give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, ushers, why don't you get ready?